mentioned, I meant to mention this last week, and I haven't, and uh, Tim reminded me. It's a good thing, because I was going to forget again. Uh, many of you have been praying. I don't see that they're here with us this morning, but many of you have been praying for Melinda Ingram. Uh, last couple of weeks, she had a, a very serious illness, ended up in the intensive care unit here at Stevens, and weren't sure what was going on, and uh, we're happy to report, for those of you who didn't already know, that she is doing very well, gaining her strength back. They found out that she had two uh, tick-borne infections, or I, don't, I guess that's what you call them, infections of some kind, and uh, so they're able to get on top of that, and she's doing much better, but I, I actually saw her the other day uh, for a moment, and uh, so we're grateful for that, and thank you for praying for her, and also... I don't see that they're here this morning either, but some of you have had a chance to meet uh, Alan and Jenna Mulandi uh, over the past few weeks. They've been attending church here, and if you, if you haven't met Alan and Jenna, then you probably didn't notice. If you met them, you would have noticed that Jenna was incredibly pregnant, if I can describe it that way. And uh, last uh, Wednesday, they had their baby, a beautiful little baby girl, and Wow, they're not here, so if I've mispronounced it, they, they won't know. But I think it's Malaika, I think is, is uh, their little one's name. So we're very grateful uh, for that, to the Lord for answering those prayers for us. And I wanted to mention that to you as well. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about our partnership covenant. If you have a, a bulletin this morning, there was one in there, and uh, we have some more here as well. We're going to be talking about that a little bit. And and I know some of you have some questions, and we're going to read through it here in a few minutes. But before we do that, Tim referred to it last week, but before we do that, I want us to talk about something else. I want us to talk about a word that is not very well received in our society today. I don't know, how many, how many of you folks know what I mean when I say, you know, four-letter words, right? Right? four-letter words, you know what those are. Only Jim. We'll talk about that afterwards, Jim, but uh, you know what I mean, right? Word, dirty words, words that you're not supposed to say, right? Bad words. We often call them four-letter words. Well, this word kind of falls into that category as a, as a word that people don't like to use anymore, but this one is, is ten letters. This is the word commitment, that's been kind of become a, a dirty word in our society. People, people don't like to commit to anything. Uh, if you don't believe me, then all you have to do is uh, put a list out and ask people to sign up for something that's going to happen in a month. People will avoid that like the plague. I don't know what's going on. Something might come up. Something else might happen. I might get a better offer. I don't know what it is, but we have a hard time committing to anything. I think really, in many ways, commitment is, is kind of a lost art, if we could call it that. I don't know. How, is anybody else here a college basketball fan? <laughs> wow. Uh, we're a lonely crew here this morning. Okay. Well, anyway, for those of you who are not, I'll, I'll just uh, fill you in a little bit. There are a lot of intense rivalries in college basketball. That's one of the reasons why I love them. And uh, I love college basketball. One of the intense rivalries is between the University of Kentucky and the University of Louisville. Now, if you are from Kentucky, you would say Louisville, but we're not. We're from the north, so we'll say Louisville. So you get the University of Louisville and the University of Kentucky, and they absolutely hate each other. They're at opposite ends of the same state. They absolutely despise each other, and whenever they play, it's very, very intense. And uh, they were playing a few years ago in Rupp Arena, which is where is Kentucky's home floor. And when they play, there's never an empty seat. It's 30-some thousand seats, and it is packed every time. But this time in particular, there was an empty seat very, very close to the front. And a gentleman walked up and noticed an elderly lady sitting beside this empty seat, and he said, Ma'am, I, I got to tell you, I almost never see an empty seat in this arena, but especially when these two teams play, why is this seat empty? And the lady explained that she and her late husband had been season ticket holders for 28 years, and that was her late husband's seat. And he said, well, 
Couldn't you have gotten a, a family member or a friend to come with you? I mean, it's, it's such a shame to waste the seat. And she said, well, I tried, but are you kidding? They're all at his funeral. So <laughs> anyway, commitment. That's what we're talking about. Commitment. It means no matter what, I am going to do what I have said that I would do. Actually, commitment means the state of being dedicated to a cause or the act of binding yourself to a particular course of action. And this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity for those of you who, who want to be a part of what we're doing at Moss Brook to actually physically do that, to sign your name to this covenant and partner with us in what we believe that God is asking us to do in this community. And I talk to people all the time. I had a couple of conversations before the service this morning. Well, why do we do it this way? Why have we chosen to do this? Well, part of the reason is because sometimes an actual physical act of making a commitment helps us. It binds us to what we are saying. And you're, you're not making a promise to me. You're not making a promise to Tim. You're not even making a promise to our church. You're, you're making a promise to God. This is what I believe that you are asking me to do, God, and I am going to follow through. I'm going to commit myself to it. But why do this? Some of you may be here this morning and say, well, I don't, I don't even know if I am sure what you're talking about, and even if I am, why would I do that? Why would I commit myself to this mission? Well, this morning I'm going to give you two or three statements that I hope that will somewhat resonate with you this morning, and this is one of them, and that is that Christ's motivation, love for mankind, must be ours if we're going to commit to the challenge of impacting our community for God. Love for other people. That was Christ's commitment, that was His motivation, and it needs to be ours. The point is this. When we realize what Jesus Christ did for us, we have to respond in kind and commit everything that we are and everything that we have to reaching other people. Okay. What I'm going to present to you this morning, what I'm going to challenge you to this morning in making this commitment to be a partner with us of what God is asking us to do is going to cost something. And I understand that there are some of you that are here this morning, maybe for the first time, you've never been here before, or maybe you've been here once or twice, and you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can do this. Well, I understand that completely. A simple answer to why we would give everything that we are for other people is because that is what Christ did for us. That's what Christ did for us. And I, I want to help you to understand that for a moment here. If you have your Bibles or you want to follow along, I want to read you a couple of verses from Romans chapter 5 this morning. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now, there are, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of verses that I could read for you this morning that would give you an idea of what Christ did for us. But this one is one of my favorites, because it tells us that while we were utterly helpless, while we had nothing that we could offer God, nor did we want to offer it to God, Christ came to die for us. And I want you to notice one phrase in particular, it's in the, that eighth verse, it says, God showed his great love for us. And I want you to just think about that for a second. God showed his great love for us. That verb is the most important word in that whole verse. He showed his love for us. God didn't speak his love for us. 
He showed his love for us. He demonstrated his great love for us. And I think it's very important for us to understand that it is not enough for us to speak of our love for other people. That's not enough. Now, if we were to poll the group here this morning, or we were to make a statement as a church to this community, we could make some kind of grand statement like, we love our community. We love everyone here. We care about the people who are hurting and who have needs in this community. And that would be fine. (laughs) But I don't think it would be great. God showed his great love for us. And I don't think it's enough for us, either as individuals or as a church, to simply talk about how much we love our community. I think we have to show it by our actions, by the way that we speak, by the way that we live, by the way that we raise our children, by the way that we spend our money. We need to show that we love this community. We need to show that we love other people. And care about what's happening in their lives. And that is going to require some sacrifice. Now again, you may be here this morning and you say, okay, I I don't get it. This is a little scary. This is a little strange. What are you asking me to do? How did I get into this mess? Why did I listen to you and come here this morning? I don't know if I want to be here. I want you to understand there's a couple of stages to all of this. And the first stage is this. You have to first get to know Christ and his commitment to you. For those of you that have just come in here this morning, you're guests here, this is your first or second or third time, you don't have a relationship with Christ or you're not really sure what that means, I don't expect you to walk in here and drop everything and commit everything to Christ. I don't expect that. There's a progression of understanding that leads to commitment, okay? That's another one of the phrases I want you to remember. There's a progression of understanding that leads to commitment. And that may be true for some of you that are here this morning, and you have a relationship with Christ. You may still be saying, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I'm ready to make this kind of commitment. I understand. Listen, there is a progression of understanding that leads to to commitment. You must first get to know Christ and understand the commitment that he made to you. You must first realize that he gave everything. You need to know him. You need to grow. And I would urge you this morning to spend time, some time getting to know Christ and time reading the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I will give you one. I have some right here on my backpack. Don't use that as an excuse. If you have a smartphone, how many people have a smartphone this morning? How many people have a smartphone? Yeah, okay, a lot of you. How many people are smart enough to run your smartphone? Not quite as many, okay. If you have a smartphone, you can go on the uh, Google Play Store or you can go to the App Store and you can download the U version of the Bible for free. And it literally has 50 or 60 different versions of the Bible, and you can read it. It has reading plans. You can read the Bible in a year. You can read the Bible in 90 days. You can read the Bible in six months. I would challenge you to spend some time reading the Bible and coming to understand who Jesus Christ is, reading and listening and learning and then trusting. And I know that happens slowly. I I don't want you to think that I think that's an easy thing to do necessarily, but my prayer and my hope is that as you come to understand what Christ has done for you, that you will then understand how critical it is that you give everything you have to reach other people for Christ. And I would, if I could, just step out on a shaky little limb of our pride and our egos and suggest that 
those times in our lives, because our spiritual lives can be like a roller coaster, just like every other part of our lives, that those times when we are less committed or lack a commitment to being fully vested in what God has asked us to do, that those times in our lives are also characterized by a lack of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Did you follow that? That was a little bit more convoluted than I, it was in my mind. When we stray away from what God has done for us and understanding what he has committed to us, we lack in ourselves the motivation to commit everything we are to the cause as well. We forget what Christ has done for us. So the first stage is you first have to come to know who Christ is and understand his commitment to you. And then here's the second stage. Are you ready? This one is not quite as complicated. This is it. Number two, you must commit yourself. You got to make the commitment. When you come to this point, you you have to do it. You have to make the decision. You have to give your word. You have to to take the plunge. You have to say, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Let me read you three more verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. And I'm jumping into the middle of a conversation that Paul is having with people, but I thought it was kind of appropriate, because you may be sitting here thinking this right now. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 13 says, if it seems we are crazy, so if you think this is a crazy way to live, or I'm crazy for asking you to commit or sacrifice, if it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God, and if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Another word for that might be compels us or begs us. Listen to this. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we all have died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive the new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Jesus Christ did not die for you. He did not provide salvation for you so that you could keep living the way that you were living before. He didn't die for you so that you could dedicate your life to all of the same things to which you had dedicated your life before. He died for you and provided salvation for you so that you could live a new life, so that you could live for him. I don't know if anyone else knows the story of a man named William Borden. William Borden graduated from high school in Chicago, Illinois in 1904. Some of you may be familiar with the last name Borden, as in Borden Dairies or Borden Dairy Products. It's still around today. When William graduated from high school at the age of 17 in 1904, he was already a millionaire because he was an heir to the Borden uh, fortune. And as a graduation present, his parents sent him on a trip around the world. So the summer after he graduated from high school, he was traveling through Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East. And as he did so, he was struck with the poverty and the hopelessness of all the people that he had seen. And at one point in his journey, he wrote a letter back home and he said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to dedicate my life to foreign missions. I want to reach these people with the truth of Jesus Christ. And when he did that, about the same time he did that, he took his Bible and in the back he wrote, no reserves. When he came home from his trip, he enrolled in Yale University and as he spent his time at Yale University, he decided that he would start a small prayer group. And so he did that, and by the end of his freshman year, 150 Yale freshmen were meeting in small prayer groups around the campus at different points during the week. It was about this time that he also wrote in his Bible, this is what I dedicate myself to, say no to self 
and yes to Jesus every time. William Borden graduated from Yale four years later when he did, at the time that he did, a thousand of the 1,300 students at, the uni- at Yale University were meeting weekly for Bible study and prayer. But that wasn't his focus. He was dedicated to missions. And it was about this time that he turned down several high-paying job offers and instead enrolled in seminary. And it was at this point that he turned to the back of his Bible and he wrote, No Retreats. He graduated from seminary and decided that God was calling him to reach Muslims in the country of China. So he moved to Egypt to begin learning Arabic. And shortly after he moved to Egypt, he contacted spinal meningitis. And a month later, at 25 years old, William Borden died. But just before he died... He wrote in his Bible, under no reserves and no retreats, he wrote, no regrets. No regrets. William Borden was fully convinced that Jesus Christ had committed everything for him and that he could do nothing less in return. Say no to self. And say yes to Jesus every time. That is the key to being an effective disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, how can I do that? That's incredibly difficult to say no to self. Anybody here ever tried to say no to self? That's tough. Man, that is hard. How can I do that? The only way that we can do that is by focusing ourselves on Jesus Christ. I don't know if any of you noticed it, but before we started the service, Clow was playing one of my new, brand new favorite songs in the entire world. It's by a group called For King and Country, if you've ever heard of them, and it's called Fix My Eyes. I love this song. I've got to fix my eyes. If I'm going to say no to self, the only way that I can do that is to fix my eyes on Christ. I have to fix my eyes on eternal things. Do you know why it is so difficult to say no to self most of the time? Do you know why that's so difficult? Because we are focused on self. And when you're focusing on self, it's almost impossible to say no. I'm thinking about myself. The writer to the Hebrews was thinking this when he wrote this verse in Hebrews chapter 12. He said, This way, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we are in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. Even Jesus, when he was here on this earth, had to say no to self. And do you know how he did it? By focusing on eternal things, by focusing on what was to come. What's your commitment level? Look in the mirror. What is the limit to your commitment? Is it it convenience? Is it personal comfort? What does it take to stop you short of what you have committed to do? For Christ. One very skeptical father followed his teenage son into a sporting goods store and followed him to the weightlifting equipment as his son begged his father to buy him the set of weights. Dad, I'm going to do it. I'm going to lift weights. I got to bulk up. His father said, Son, that's going to take a lot of commitment. I know, Dad, but I'm going to do it. No, really, son, you've got to dedicate yourself to this. It has to be every day. If you're going to do this, you've got to be serious about it. I know, Dad, please, can you buy this stuff for me? Son, it's very, very expensive. The son continued to ask his father and beg his father and promise him that he would do whatever it took to be ripped. Finally, the father relented 
took out the money, paid for the weights, and headed out of the store. He'd only gone about three steps when he heard his son say, What, I have to carry these out to the car myself? <laughs> what does it take to stop you short of what you have committed to do? You see, I was thinking about this this week, and I thought of this. Hanging on to your current life will cause you to forfeit the life you so desperately seek. We're all looking for something, right? Feel it right here. You're looking for something. Something that fulfills, something that satisfies, something that's worth living your life for. Have you ever woken up and saying, what am I living my life for? Why am I even here? It's because God has put inside of us the desire to live for something more than ourselves. The problem is we're so concerned with hanging on to what we have that we miss what we're really looking for. What are you willing to forfeit? It was several years ago now. I don't remember how long ago it was, but Tim was preaching one morning, and he was talking about living life with open hands. And I still remember him standing up here talking about it like it was yesterday. And he made such an incredible point that it's just stuck in my mind. I think about it all the time. This is how we hang on to stuff, right? Whatever it is, this or this or whatever it is we have, this is how we hang on to it. I don't want to drop it. I don't want to lose it. Someone will take it away from me. But do you know what? If we hang on to our lives like this, how can we receive the things that God so desperately wants to give us? Actually, the opposite is true. If we would live our lives with open hands, oh, you know, you might lose some of this. You might have to give up that. But you can receive what it is that God really wants you to have. I believe with all my heart that what you forfeit will pale in comparison to what you will receive. Well, if you have a bulletin this morning, you've seen this here. And I don't, Does anybody else want one of these to look at this morning? There are, I have a few of them here. If anybody wants one of these, maybe we could pass a few of those out. Uh, Glenn, would you just... See, if, if you want one of those and don't have one, may you just raise your hand. You're not committing to anything by taking one, but if you want to look at one and you don't have one. It simply says that partnership includes committing myself to actively engage in connecting with lost people with the goal of seeing them come to Christ. That's our, that's our vision as a church. That's what we believe that God wants for us. Partnership includes a commitment to teamwork. I commit myself to giving everything I have to the mission. My passion, my abilities, my personality, my finances. God has given you all kinds of things. He's given each of us something different. And as a partner, I'm simply saying what I have, I, I give to God. Partnership includes committing to mutual care. That is, as a partner, I commit to being part of a small group or an LTG to know and be known, to care and be cared for. I want people to know who I am and, and what my needs are, and I want to know what the needs of other people are so that we can pray together and live life together. And it also means committing myself to service. I commit myself to serving those around me, inside the church and outside, according to God's working and leading in my life. Again, we don't want ever want what happens here at Moss Brook to just be about what happens in this room on Sunday mornings or just what happens to those of us who are a part of this group. We know we need to be out there. We need to be living life with people who need God. That's the only way they'll come to understand His love for them. 
And when you sign up for partnership, this is something that we have decided to do because a lot of churches have membership, and when you sign up for membership, a lot of times that's once for life. And we really wanted an excuse to challenge people to be committed to what God is asking them to do all the time and not just once in their lives. And so we do this. We're going to sign up for this next 12 months to be committed to what God has asked us to do. And 12 months from now, we're going to do it again, and we're going to keep doing it until God says we don't have to do it anymore. And so if this is a commitment that you want to make, you want to say, I want to be a part of what Mossbrook is doing. You're not, I'm not going to come track you down at your house. You're making a commitment to God. And if you want to do that this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity. In just a moment, the guys are going to play a song for us. It's called Jesus in Your Name, We Can Change the World. Some of you will recognize it when we have seen it. But listen, folks, we believe that God has given us this mission, and we believe that he has asked us to impact our community and to change the world. Now, can I go out there and change this world? This is a pretty big world. Can I go out there and do it by myself? Absolutely not. But together, with the help of Jesus Christ, we can impact this world. We can change this world. We can change our community. And I believe that's what God wants us to do. So the guys are going to play the video. And as they do, there are two stations set up on either side here. There's a pen there if you don't have a pen. If you are ready to make that commitment to being a partner of Mossbrook Church, then you can simply sign your name and come up and place it there. And remember what you are committing to God. If you're not ready to do that, please don't feel any obligation to. We will have some of these around for the next few weeks. If you want to talk about it, if you want to take this home and, and read it through and read the verses here and pray about it or talk with one of us about it, we would certainly love to do that. But if you're ready to make that commitment, you can make it this morning. So why do we do this? We do this because of what Christ has done for us. For no other reason than that. Imagine if Christ had stopped short in his commitment. What if Christ had said, well, I'll come to the earth, but I won't die? We wouldn't have salvation. We wouldn't have anything. He was willing to give it all. Now, this won't be easy, either individually, personally, or corporately. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin which easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that is Christ that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and now he is seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Sometimes there are things that we need to leave behind in order to run the race. Sometimes there are things that we're hanging on to that are hanging off us that we need to get rid of. It's not going to be easy. I found this quote this week. We're going to close with a song, but I want to read this quote for you by a man by the name of Phillips Brooks. And he said this, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. I'm often guilty of praying for an easy life. Don't pray for an easy life. Pray for the power that you need to live the life that God is calling you to live. 